Good morning. How many of you have been here already? I can't see anything anyway, but I can tell you probably not that many. Uh, this is the biggest screen in Britain. Uh, and I can tell you one thing. I'll tell you a little secret. I'm not sure who said that size doesn't matter, but I can tell you one thing. This is by far the biggest demo day screen I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty glad about this. So I just wanted to officially welcome you to the IMAX. Not bad, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We are so happy to be here. And I wanted to officially welcome you also to, more importantly, our Startup Bootcamp IoT Demo Day 2019. We have an amazing day for you today. Freaking awesome, as they say in some places. We basically have worked really, really hard with seven of our teams that you will have the pleasure to see on stage uh, later today. We have a lot of innovation to share, and it's obviously all about IoT, but before we get into this, I just wanted to share with you something that's important. Those teams need your help, need our help, need everybody's help, because as you can imagine, the more visibility they get, the better you know, for them. So, share the love. This is a Twitter account, you can log in, you have all the logins for the particular sort of uh, IMAX, it's free, you just log in registered. You know, use Twitter, use Facebook, use, uh, you know, Snapchat, computer serve, I don't care, just share it. Just make sure that everybody knows about those guys. Okay? So because it's all about IoT, I figured I wanted to obviously introduce the session talking about IoT. So what, what is IoT? Start my days, like sun rays, like I tap the phone, like coffee's on, like I mow the lawn, impressing like Sean, like so connected, like so effective, like I let it drop, like clean it up, like heat and smart, like I do my part. Like no, 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 so no, so this is not our version of IoT, right? Sure. This is their, you know, our friends at Bosch think that this is a good thing. This was their video for CS this year, by the way. Great, funny. Not what we're looking at. Today, you'll see we'll talk more about Internet of Things in a way that are scalable, in ways that are making a long-lasting impact. You know, companies are really changing the boundaries. And so it's focusing more about the I high OT. There's a little I on top, right? That makes a big difference. So let me tell you a bit more about those segments that are key for us, right? So IoT in the industrial space is about all of those. Retail, smart mobility, smart healthcare, smart manufacturing, building city, you know, all of those equipped, uh, you've seen that and, and, you know, it's been on the press everywhere. But we talk about also a very key set of technologies supporting and enabling those pieces of, of, uh, of connected devices, such as voice, such as AI, and to some extent, you know, blockchain as well. So those are things that we're focusing on. Those are things that make a difference. But we love it so much that we figured we'd do one more thing and we'll get the extra step. And what we've done is we've worked with our friends at EY to actually commission a full-on report around the industrial IoT space. So keep watching the space. In the next few weeks, we'll release that report. And I'm really proud of that because, of course, it's full of very interesting conversations, full of very good topics that we wanted to, to, uh, to highlight, including, yeah, the, the elephant in the room, security and trust. So keep watching this. We'll be released over the next few weeks. Now let me come back and give you a quick update on what we do and who we are and what we've done this year at Startup Bootcamp. Because boy, it's been a hell of a year. And you know, we've grown so fast. We've really done a big difference. And one of the things I want to be focusing on is the impact that we've made. There's a lot of things that are, you know, in the world are focusing on, on specifically you know, early stage companies and technology. But what we really wanted to do is make sure that we did that in, a, in an impactful way. And so if you look at our, our milestone right now, our footprint is pretty significant. You know, we've have today 23 programs, 20 cities, 16, six continents, basically you know, grown by 10 more programs. We just launched Qatar and a couple of other places. So it's significantly wide, but also you know, look at the numbers. They speak for themselves. You know, over the last 10 years, we've helped north of 700 companies. And 70% of them are still active today. I don't know how many of you understand that early stage is the riskiest of them all. But when it comes to actually having a company that sustained the course of six, seven, ten years, 
It's a spectacular exercise, and you know, we're very proud of that. One more thing, though, is that number here. Now you can clap, that's okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's very good, but not good enough, right? But we're getting there, and I'm very, very proud that, you know, in the very last report of our guys and uh, friends at Crunchbase, we are actually in the number four biggest seed investor, uh, you know, investing in female-led companies, you know, after, you know, famous names such as YC, 500 Startups, and Techstars. Significant effort. So that's one of the pillars that we're building to make sure that, you know, in the future, the uh, founders that we empower are, you know, of every kind. Now, let me tell you about Startup IoT. You know, Startup Bootcamp IoT is the, 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 the program that I founded four years ago now. We are on the third year, and I just wanted to have a quick recap of what we've done over the last three years, really. Those are the numbers that we throw. So a lot of them in that slide, not necessarily, you know, uh, looking at all of them. Two that I wanted to highlight, though. We've literally invested in 25 companies so far. We've looked and talked to more than 4,500 startups across the world. I, myself, for some of those who know, I've been on a plane quite a lot to make sure that we meet those founders, because it doesn't just happen around the corner. It's about meeting the right people. It's about the teams. It's always about the teams. And, you know, we've literally, you know, visited close to 40 cities. And over the course of those exercises, we met incredible people. And we have currently a portfolio estimated at around 50 million. But more than that, you know, we help those guys get visible. And we've touched more than 400 investors today, not talking about our corporate partners that, of course, are helping them on a daily basis. So this is what we've done and achieved over the last three years. This is the beginning of the journey every year, the selection days, where we have our guys coming in, short list of about 20 companies invited, coming to London. And you can see the face. This seems pretty happy, right? They're, they're good. And it's been a really great year for us. And this is the example of 2018. You look at what it comes to, and of course, those are the companies you'll see today. A range from sustainability, supply chain, energy, security, aviation, you name it. Really amazing companies that I'm sure you'll agree with me once we go over the presentations, have a bright future. But I wanted to you know, pay a special thank you to our, you know, this is always the slide that you need to have in there, but I really mean it, our corporate partners. Without those guys, we would not be here. None of you would be here. I certainly wouldn't be here today. So I just want to have a big round of applause for those guys, please. <laughs> Agenda of today. Very simple. The first part we've already done. I'm going to close my presentation inviting on the stage a good friend, somebody who's been in the family for some time, and he'll tell you all about the journey that we've had, an amazing one. But then afterwards, just after that, it's all about the companies, of course, because today is all about the startups, and I want you to focus on that specifically. And then, clearly not 1.45, because we're already late, but around 12, I think, roughly, we'll go back downstairs where we'll have snacks, and you keep on talking to the companies uh, where the, you're going to see their products, and they can give you more details about what they do. So without further ado, I'd like to invite my friend Jackson to the stage. Round of applause, please. Thanks, Thank Jackson is from Relayer, so we were supposed to have yeah, You can't see anything. We, really. No, right, that's the point. We okay to stand? We get to stand, right? We stand, we're yeah. We're standing. Good. All right. You can see him. This is Jackson. So Jackson's been in the family for a little while. As you can see, he's been one of the alumnus of Startup Bootcamp Amsterdam in 2013 now, quite some time ago. Oh, look at five that. Five years, five years. Thank you, Paolo. Oh. Thanks, Paolo. Yeah, yep. close for Paolo. <laughs> Beautiful you. chairs, man. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, please. No, 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 please, no. please. Go, okay. you're the guest. I'll wait, I'll wait. We'll sit together. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to have a quick chat with, uh, with Jackson for the reason, is two reasons mainly. Uh, in addition to the fact that we love having chat together, but the first one is, as we said, it's an alumnus of Startup Bootcamp, but it's also a company that is working in our field, in the world of IoT. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's make ourselves comfortable. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Ah, oh, that's better. You all right? Yes, you have a whiskey right. or something? We get cocktails? A bit early, maybe. <laughs> um, the second reason I wanted to speak to you is, is one that is quite big, is a journey that you've gone through in only five years from what used to be uh, and still is a service uh, company, and you know, oriented into enterprise, and initially even though targeting you know the IoT uh, device market. And this this photo on the left that you see, guys, is a photo that I took at the demo day in Amsterdam. Patrick is in the room. I remember that very well. Uh, it's basically their very first uh, supported product, but I'll let you talk about it. Down to 
very recently that massive news that you can see on my uh, on your right on my left side acquisition by Munich Re. So how about we go back a little bit in time and you know tell the audience how did that come about and what was the journey to get there? Let's do that. <laughs> so you started the company in 2013. 13. Right. right before we get into uh, sort of weekend. Uh, April, actually, 2013. April. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Two founders, co-founders? Three? Two, well, three in total. Three in total. Right. Uh, corporate background, mainly, but not only? Uh, yes. Mix? Mix, actually, yes. We had two startup guys, me and, my, and Paul, the CTO, uh, startup guys. Right. Harold from Cisco. Exactly. All right. right. And so tell us a bit more about how you came about, you know, this particular type of industry, what it was, and where you've gone into today. Um, so I think a lot has changed in five years. In fact, yeah. um, it changed quite quite radically. Um, maybe I'll start with what you see on the on the left. The our focus on or our thought our thought that we should approach um, the device side of the equation. IoT, as you know, is where you bridge hardware and software, and the vision was, as you see on that one slide there, it was becoming a, a middleware for connecting all sorts of um, heterogeneous uh, connected devices and becoming sort of the hub. Um, a great idea, but in reality, um, and I remember pitching in the very first, uh, I guess it was the selection days, and there were something like, I don't know, 40, 50 pitches over two days, and I think nobody, nobody, from those 40 or 50 pitches understood what we wanted to do. Um, in fact... It's a good start. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was quite daunting, and we, we began to sort of adjust the pitch over those selection days. I don't know why Patrick and the team chose us, but they decided that we should Thanks, be Thanks, Patrick. Uh, well Patrick, done, maybe you should answer that <laughs> later. But um, So we, we were accepted. Um, and the sole purpose that we wanted to achieve with the Startup Boot Camp was to figure out our go-to-market. And that's where we came up with the idea that a cloud platform is far too nebulous um, mm -hmm. nice for job. most people to, to understand. We need to make it plastic. We need to make it literally something you can feel and see, and it's emotional and psychological. And um, that's where the idea of, of, a, of a Trojan horse, if you will, a Trojan horse, um, a piece of, of hardware. And um, because we knew we were connecting software and hardware, um, Patrick and the team said, guys, you got to get out of the house. you got to go talk to people, talk to your target audience. Our target audience were supposed to be engineers and developers. So we went out and talked to them. And we realized that the engineers, the hardware guys, didn't understand application development. And the application developers didn't understand the hardware side. They didn't know how to uh, connect things. So there was something missing. So we said, OK, why don't we make something that connects both of these guys and make it really, really easy for the app developers to actually connect without having to know anything about the hardware. Um, and then the hardware guys can go around and connect their Raspberry Pis and, and have apps suddenly and, think, and do things and see the data immediately. And so that's where the, the idea for the Wonder Bar came up. Uh, it was not the Wonder Bar. It was more of a piece of hardware. And then over the iterations, it became, it became this. Today, we wish we could forget the Wonder Bar. <laughs> Today, we wish it didn't exist, because it's still very distracting for um, when we're talking to customers. They say, you guys make the Wonder Bar. No, we don't make the Wonder Bar. We have nothing to do with the Wonder Bar. Forget about the Wonder Bar. Um, everything's changed. Um, and the idea then was broad, create developer tools for a variety and any developer with all SDKs that you could imagine, all APIs that you could imagine, and allow anyone with any uh, programming skills to, to connect. Um, we went from this to this now, right? We're now so focused, and it was that iter iterative process that I think is very important also for everyone in the room to understand, and particularly the ones, the companies that are pitching today, the seven companies, um, so important to, to focus. Um, that said, going broad really helped. Yeah. Going broad, listening to customers, talking, constantly talking, constantly pitching, constantly understanding what the market needs and wants, don't come to the market with preconceived notions um, that you can't change. Be prepared to change. And that's what we did. And so we brought that down. Uh, by the time we raised our, our seed funding, uh, we were joined by Joseph Brunner, who had sold his company to, <coughs> to Cisco um, successfully. And he realized the importance of sales. Right. 
And that's where also things changed radically for us was we were building a tool set as product and tech guys and became suddenly a sales organization. And that changed our path. Um, yeah, so on that, I think, I think we, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's great because you've already yeah. talked about so kind of the pivot that you did, if so, between, you know, even though you were not a product company, but clearly, you know, focusing a little less on that and more on the enterprise sales by Joseph coming in as well. So that was the initial idea. You talked about already one lesson that we're going to be giving to the guys, which is, you know, focus on you go to market and make sure you have a market there, right? And that's one of the reasons you came to Startup Bootcamp. Um, and fundraising. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. So what was the journey of fundraising, uh, different steps up to, you know, the, the final, or the final, the exit recently, which is sure, not sure. another story. But so by the time Joseph joined in, what was it, beginning of 2015, I think, right. um, you know, we were, we were looking at the end of life. Right. It was, a, of, you know, it was basically right. like, okay, that was, a, that was a quick two years. Um, let's wrap this up and move on. Um, because nobody understood what we were trying to achieve. But because his previous business was cloud-based, and it was enterprise-based, and it was, all, it was effectively IoT, but it was in the energy management space, um, he understood immediately what we were trying to do and saw the potential that we didn't see. We were focused on tools. He was focused on solutions and sales. Um, and that, that, was the, that was the most important thing. Um, and after that, things began, because of his network, things yep. began to get a little bit easier in the fundraising. And we raised um, a Series A from Kleiner Perkins, which was quite um, a surprise for all of us, uh, that they would uh, come across the pond and decide to invest in Europe and, and in our company, of all things, you know, because they, they make big moonshot deals. Yeah. They invest in Google and, and, um, and Amazon and things like that. Those small guys. And we were, <laughs> yeah. So, so that, was, that was exciting, and that kind of led to the next round, the Series B, which was Munich Re, yep. the insurance company, which then led, of course, after a year and a half of, of um, that into, um, into the acquisition. acquisition. Great. Right. So I think one, one of the, the key lessons for me, and there's a, there's a few in there, of course, but one of the key lessons for me is, first of all, don't be afraid to bring new blood that can sort of not only save the company, but just bring additional skill set that you might not have in the first place in the company, right? But you should always be on the lookout for those to, that can extend your footprint. The A players that you might the have A players, already. always build that network. Yeah. So that's number one thing. And then you know, we talk about this with every one of the guys in the, in the room at our startups is, you know, talent, talent, talent. Yeah. Uh, be ready to, uh, to hire somebody who's probably better than you, but brings, uh, you know, something different. Uh, that's the first one. Absolutely. The second one, timing, right? Timing is everything in terms of what you worked on. And you, you were lucky having probably not only luck, but, you know, it was amazing to see Kleiner Perkins coming over. But it clearly fast-tracked as well the rest of the journey, right? That helps you getting that. Um, how did you get to those guys? Or did they get to you? Where was the connection there? Um, that came through, um, uh, through Joseph's network right. and through our, our initial, um, initial fundraising. And there were a couple of conversations. It was initial... Initial confusion, initial disinterest, and then suddenly something clicked. Right. Um, and it was also just persistence, you know, not, not taking no necessarily for an answer, but just keep going back. Oh, yeah. No. If, that's, if that's the investor you want, don't let go. Come back and back. Keep, keep and going back. back. And exactly. Back. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, closing on this, the Munich Ray thing. I think the, 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 the amazing journey they have gone through recently is the fact that it's not necessarily a given that an investor become somebody who's acquiring the company, obviously. Um, it's, it's a natural path if things work out, but it's not necessarily the, the obligation. So how did that happen? And so how did the, the journey from that is, is gone through? And then we'll go and close maybe on, um, you know, does it change life for you? Into, not, not personally, but I mean the business side. Uh, yeah, and then we'll, we'll close on a few things. Sure, I think, um, so that was a strategic decision on our part. Um, they, we got in touch with them, they approached us actually, and we had some discussions, and it wasn't in, in immediately, for us anyway, clear why that made sense. Right. Um, and in fact, it wasn't really clear why that made sense for, I think, Munich Re slash Hartford Steam Boiler, which is, yep. Hartford Steam Boiler is the investment uh, vehicle that they use. It's an insurance company also, but they also have a venture arm mm -hmm. based in Silicon Valley. And they discovered us. They were already investing in AI. They were already investing in sort of the ecosystem parts of, of, um, of collecting data for de-risking purposes. Right. As an insurance company, their primary target is to de-risk um, and come up with innovative uh, packages around that. But now, in retrospect, we can say it's actually highly synergetic. Why? Because 
what we were trying to do and trying to achieve is effectively the exact same thing. As we focus on industrial machines, we were trying to predict their downtime, effectively de-risk right. through real-time data. An insurance company does the exact same thing. They're de-risking with data. They do it with historical data because yeah. they don't have any access to real-time data. So they do it with thousands and thousands of inspectors who go around and inspect physical assets and then write them down and then create large uh, you know, spreadsheets and risk models and decide, okay, we can package this this way and sell it. With real-time data, you have real-time risk, yeah. real-time risk models, adjustable risk, dynamic risk, risk that you can spread out uh, or um, customize per machine, mm -hmm. if you think about it, because it's, it's coming off this, this, the same model of machine that's located in Singapore, a highly human environment, yep. is going to be different and behave differently than one that's in Tucson, Arizona, a very dry, arid environment. Right? So they, they deserve different risk profiles, not one for, for that machine. And I think that's what's, that's what's changing. And we realize that it's highly synergetic in terms of, in terms of the, moving the world to a predictive state, which is mm -hmm. what's happening. Excellent. Let's close on um, what we discussed earlier together. It's just one of two, two or three lessons that I'd like, you know, to give or you'd like to give to you know those young entrepreneurs that have, you know, at the beginning of their journey, basically, and you know things that you might have learned, mistakes you've made. Things. Well, I hope some of them are a little older, not not only the yeah, young ones. But they, are, they, are, they are. They are. They are. Age doesn't matter in that case. Right. It's more about the you know. The I, I had a little gray hair when we started <laughs> five years ago. Now I've got a lot of gray. Yeah, hair. don't tell me about it. Go ahead. So lessons. So lessons, um, I think there are basically two lessons for me. Um, to you would be one, flexibility. So always, constant, I said it before, constantly pitching, constantly pitching, listening to the market and understanding what the market needs right. from your vision. Mm -hmm. Hold on to your vision, but adjust it. Because it's going to be a very zigzaggy path. Climbing that mountain is not straight up, it's going to be zigzagging. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I would say sales. Sales, 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 sales. You have to have a top-notch salesperson in your team, yeah. a guy or a woman who is just, who just breathes selling and sales. You know, these guys just want to sell. Rings a bell, people? Right? Selling? If you don't have that on your team, <laughs> if you don't have that person on your team, find him or, him yeah. or her because um, it's going to be a slow journey. Yes. Yeah. I will conclude on that. I think that's the best conclusion. Jackson, thank you so much for being here. Very people. welcome. Very welcome. Want some applause? Once again. All right. All right. I think this is amazing. I love, I love the fact that we have uh, a real example of how we can do it, transform uh, the SA, I would say. Uh, and, and, of course, a lot of lessons there. We could have spent a lot more time. But really today, as we talked about, is about those guys who are about to embark on that journey. Some are a little bit further down than others. But at the end of the day, those lessons are critical. And one of the things that I really love is the fact that we keep telling them talent and flexibility is everything. And so... If it's coming from somebody who's done it, it's probably even faster and better. So I want to invite to the stage David, one of our key mentors, is going to be introducing an amazing company. David, come on. Morning, everyone. So it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, and it's even greater privilege to introduce this next company. Um, in particular because it's a, a chat, they're working on a challenge that's very close to my heart. I actually have a close family friend who uh, suffers from the illness that they're trying to uh, tackle. Um, I can tell you that the distress that, that the sufferer uh, endures um, is not only just themselves, but it's also their family and friends. And as a result, um, any offering that can bring uh, earlier diagnosis or um, uh, ongoing mentor, uh, monitoring is going to be very, very um, welcomed by many people. Um, I think they've got a great chance, uh, Alexander and Maria, to develop a successful business. They're really well placed for that because they've got two key advantages. Firstly, um, technical excellence, you know, their track record, but also um, the product they've developed I think is amazing and I'm really looking forward to seeing it uh, out there. Um, doing what it does best. Uh, and secondly, I think when you meet them, you'll really get a sense of the genuine uh, compassion and empathy that they've got for the user and their family. And I think that's really important, as we heard earlier, to focus on their needs. Um, so without further ado from me, please give, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Alexander from Mekian.
Every three seconds, someone in the world is diagnosed with dementia. This means that more than 50 family members of the people in this room today might have dementia in their later life. The reality is that our modern lifestyle does not allow us to spend time with loved ones. Working hours, living away from home, all play a role. And sadly, a lot of people don't even know what those signs are. As you can imagine, late diagnosis has huge social and economic impacts. Increased drug consumption, family budgets overstretched, stress and anxiety to those affected. Just as an example, the care home cost in the UK starts from £30,000 a year. Ladies and gents, my name is Alexander Gyokas, co-founder of Mekion. And I'm here today to tell you how we plan to change all this. Our product, Iris, is a smart device you place on a wall. It decodes human behavior using facial recognition. It is somewhat similar to a smoke alarm. It warns you about dementia signs. It does that by detecting emotions, agitation, aggression, sadness and anger. It can even detect nighttime wandering. And as you can imagine, this is extremely useful to family members. It answers two fundamental questions. How is my loved one doing and what can I do to help? And this in turn allows for lifestyle modification, improving the quality of life of those affected. If you know someone's behavior is changing, you can take early action in the most appropriate way. Our mission is to empower those affected by dementia to continue living independently. And IRIS offers peace of mind and reduces the stress and anxiety to those involved and affected. We incorporated in early 2018 and have since developed three different versions of the IRIS device. We understand what's at stake here. We've interviewed doctors, nurses, clinicians, patients and families. And what we're working on right now is already receiving global recognition. In the past year, we've reached three agreements, one with a hospital in Italy, one with a hospital in England, and one with a university in Japan. In December 2018, we won in the Seas to Grow competition which will allow us to place more than 20 of our devices in people's homes in the UK and the Netherlands. We know that people want this. We've done a user focus group study through Coventry University Enterprises achieving a 100% acceptability score. Our own online anonymous survey, 70% of the carers said they want to test a device. We plan on selling the Iris device, followed by a monthly subscription of £20. And we have three distribution channels. Our own website, online platforms such as Amazon, and specific partnerships with age tech retailers. We estimate on our fourth year of operations to be generating more than £5 million revenue. To put this into perspective, Forbes forecasts that the age tech market will rise to $26 billion in 2024. Our team is made up of me, my co-founder Maria Ramos, and two expert advisors. Me and Maria have a combined experience for more than 16 years. We've worked together for, for three years, and we've delivered projects for very big corporations and organizations. Ericsson, Serco, TSR, Wind, the EU Commission, and even Warwick University. We are starting trials, clinical trials and user trials in April, scheduled to run until August, after which we go live. We're currently seeking funding of £350,000, which will allow us to continue the development and go through the trials. 
we know that we can help those affected by dementia to continue living independently, with dignity, in their own homes for as long as possible. We believe this is worth fighting for, so please come talk to us after the end of the presentations. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, sorry for the nasal voice, it seems to be the season for it. So hi, I'm Papatia. Um, I work for R Squared Data Labs. Um, we are the center of excellence for data innovation and data science at Rolls-Royce. Um, we as Rolls-Royce have been um, working quite closely with the Startup Bootcamp uh, cohort this year. Um, as Raf said, we are um, one of the program partners and very proud to be so. Um, I personally have been very lucky to get to know Ahmed um, and the team at Sweet Tech over the last few months. Um, what makes Sweet Tech really unique and interesting in my eyes is the innovative combination of technologies that they bring together in a single solution. So their solution covers both um, autonomous systems AI-based uh, machine vision and object recognition and advanced analytics. And they're bringing those things together to develop a solution to a challenge which is well-documented, but also costly and profoundly difficult to address in an aerospace context. So I'm really excited for what the future holds for them. Uh, without further ado, I present Sweep Tech. <laughs> In year 2000, Air France Concorde crashed, killing 109 passengers on board. This was due to a little piece of metal lying on the runway. During takeoff, it flew, punctured the fuel tank, causing the crash. Since then, airports invested millions of dollars in technology that autonomously detect debris on the runway. But what about other areas of the airfield? The aircraft stands are one main source of debris. Jet engines are able to blow debris from there back to the runway, or even ingest it itself, breaking the engine blades. To solve the problem, airports deploy their airside personnel to go and manually pick up the debris from the ground. Imagine walking in an auditorium that is three times the size of this one, looking for a coin on the ground. It exposes us to human error and wastes their time. We know this is not efficient because of the numbers. Today, the global cost of debris damage is a staggering 10 billion pounds annually. And a single airline can spend up to eight million pounds every month just to replace a single engine that broke due to debris damage. But things doesn't have to be this way. At Sweep Tech, we solve the problem by fixing smart cameras at each aircraft stand, which will autonomously detect debris and report it to the airside operations, who will then dispatch their airside personnel to go and solve the problem. Check out this. Not just that we can detect debris as you see, but we can also see what have been unseen. For example, we can differentiate between water puddles and oil leaks in the aircraft stand, something that you would not recognize just by looking at it. Also, we recognize each and every ground equipment. We can tell airports if everything is in the right place at the right time. This is important because it helps airside operations save time. It helps airports improve their overall safety because, of, because instead of scheduled manual scanning, you have a 24 hours autonomous detection of debris. And ultimately, we're saving airlines heavy maintenance costs. I'm very happy to announce that the UK's largest airport have sent us just yesterday a letter of interest in our product. Not just that, we already have more than six major airports interested in Sweep Tech all over the world. In the Middle East, in Asia, in North America, and Europe. 
and we already have four pilot requests we need to satisfy. This, our business model is based on direct sales of the camera systems, hardware, it's a part of the airport's infrastructure, and then we charge an annual subscription for the software and AI we are integrating within the hardware. This is a massive market. We're talking about all the airports worldwide, and even outside aviation as well. But for aviation, that's an 18 billion pound market. Our early adopters will be the busy international airports. If you look at the UK, how many international busy airports do we, do we have? Around 30 of them, worth of 14 million pounds to make in the UK only. For our competition, we know that there are around six companies trying to solve the same problem, three of which are only doing it autonomously like us. However, we are different because we are the first to automate debris detection at the aircraft stand area, while our competition, the closest one, are doing for the runway only. We have a fascinating team with a wide aviation network, years of debris research, and masters in computer vision and artificial intelligence. We have financial mentors and mentors from, from Rolls-Royce at the heart of aerospace industry. We have four pilots we need to satisfy, a marketing campaign we need to execute beyond the pilot for growth, and an amazing project that can be even better. To do so, we need to seed fund our company 500,000 pounds for this stage. So let's together make our next trip safer and improve the overall aviation safety. Please come and visit us after the pitch, check out our demo, and see how this magic actually works. Thank you so much. This was Ahmed El Rais from Sweep Tech. Uh, my name is Arvind Pal Singh. Um, you can see that on the board there. Um, and I have the pleasure of having worked with VAF and with Kansu for a few years here now. Now, it's, it's really nice when you're in the IoT space because you're in the data space. And when you're in the data space and data is oil, anything's possible, right? Uh, so last year I had the privilege, and I talked about team and tech. This year I'll talk about team a little bit um, in introducing, you know, these great guys, Helena, Ormas, Christian, Maria, Linda, you know, really uh, cool set of guys who've been working together for a few years here. So this is not newness. This is validated. These guys have been playing at this. Um, if you've seen the pictures of them on the boats, not falling off, but, uh, you know, testing that they shouldn't fall off, um, you, you see that they've actually been out there. They've been working with the... Uh, with these uh, fishermen, with the oil rigs, with the um, ships and et cetera, and these different industries, different segments that they're playing with, thinking about what are the real life situations, understanding the data, understanding what it means, understanding what it means to other parts, other types of industries. So a very validated, very robust team coming on here, and I'm very proud to be part of that and to be helping um, in that. And the last point, which I think is the most important point for the investors out there, you know, all this aside, this is all very interesting, but this is the land of Estonia. And we all know Estonian companies bring in billions of dollars, right? Uh, they're all Skype. So if you've got money, the ROI is massive. You know, we can assume that 8.5 billion is just the floor on the valuation of this company. Um, so please, you know, do welcome Helena and do, you know, give a lot of energy for the great work they're doing. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> we live in a world surrounded by technology. It's integrated into every part of our lives and work. It solves continuous problems for us. And yet, in high-risk environments, such as oil rigs, fish farms, construction sites, we are not using the technology to protect the people most vulnerable to work accidents. It's estimated that over a thousand people are killed in work accidents every day. In Europe, we spend 3.3% of our annual GDP on costs related to work accidents and injuries. In addition, 
companies spend millions of euros on costs related to increased insurance premiums and compensations. The good news is that most work accidents are preventable. My name is Helena and I am from Tulles. Tulles helps companies to detect, respond and prevent work accidents in real time. By embedding the sensors into safety clothes that the workers wear on site every day. Some of the features include fall detection, the most common cause of work accident, monitor of vital signs so we can provide critical information about the health status of the worker, GPS tracking to find the position of the injured worker. In addition to increase safety, we have also included detection of fatigue and speech to text for hands-free reporting and an SOS button in case something goes wrong. But how do we reduce risk? By collecting and analyzing data from the sensors. Through machine learning, we can learn about the cause of the work accident and we can also learn and take preventative actions so it doesn't happen again. Our sensor concept is highly scalable because it can be applied to any high-risk environment and any workwear. Our first three main segments are oil and gas, maritime and aquaculture, and infrastructure. These industries have the highest number of work accidents and employ over 300 million employees in the world. And on that, I am very happy to announce that we have just signed our first pilot customer. <laughs> it's Estonian State Railway, the biggest railway operator in the Baltics. We are also closing on two additional pilots in oil and gas and aquaculture during the spring. Our business model is simple. We license the sensors to other workwear manufacturers. We take a platform subscri subscription fee for companies that use our sensors. And finally, we share data and valuable insights to third parties such as insurance companies. Our competition can mainly be divided into two parts, traditional workwear manufacturers and wearables. In Tulles, we take the best features from both of them and combine them into one cross-industry solution. By embedding the sensors into the work clothing, we make sure that the sensors are in constant use and don't disturb the workers in their daily routines. We have a highly skilled and experienced team to make all this happen. We have expertise in safety clothing, sensor technology and data communication. And all together, we have several decades of experience in industries from very, very well-known companies. I am also very proud to pronounce or to, to uh, announce our uh, board of advisors. 
Our board of advisors comes from respectable companies such as Sunto, Immarsat and Ericsson. And they help us to gain industry, in, uh, industry access in, in, uh, in a senior level. Our team is highly ambitious. We have a validated market. We have a clear roadmap. And we have three pilots launching this spring. But to do that, we need your help. In our first seed round, we're looking for 300,000 pounds to finalize the first three pilots and to launch our dashboard. Our vision is to raise the bar and set a new safety standard in the industry. We want to combine and use technology to make a real human impact to save lives and reduce number of work accidents in an industry that kills 1,000 people per day. My name is Helena. I am from Tulles. And we would love to talk more about Tulles with you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Nick Butlin. Um, I'm CTO of Ev Energy. I've been involved in uh, growing and building and starting uh, technology businesses in the energy space for, for over a decade since I left aerospace. Um, and would you believe it, despite all that effort, there are lots of problems that still exist. There are huge challenges in energy uh, as we decarbonize, as we bring about a new era of clean transports. And the prices of energy are rising as we build new infrastructure, as we run renewables, as we build battery storage, uh, and we build these things in distributed places, and we're creating this incredibly complex system. And there are lots of different players in it. Um, and uh, you know, National Grid and, and, and other system operators are working really hard to build new ways of making the system flexible and clean and helping us reduce those costs, which is great if you're one of the bigger players. Um, and you know, but if you're one of the smaller players, if you're one of the smaller, uh, sorry, commercial businesses, you're buying energy, you're kind of getting left behind. You're, you're paying for this expensive infrastructure and you're not getting the opportunity to take part in these, um, these very valuable programs that allow you to cut your energy costs. So it's been great to, to, to be working with these, these super smart guys, um, Lee and Vijay and the rest of the team, who have uh, some incredible technology and they've built an, a, a brilliant understanding of both the... Uh, uh, the customer side, so those, those small businesses, the energy managers, the facilities managers, uh, the butchers, who just need to understand how they can cut their costs. And at the same time, the complexity of a system where you've got all of these different players creating new programs um, and, and you know, building this understanding and bringing it together. And they've, they've really learned a lot, they've really grown a lot, and um, I think they've, they've come to a really compelling, very simple, uh, AI-driven service, um, which is which is absolutely fantastic when it comes to customer adoption, um, and um, I think what they're doing is amazing. So please join me in welcoming VJ from Q Energy. Hi everyone, I'm VJ, co-founder of Q Energy. Imagine yourself as the building manager of a large building like the Science Museum you're in. As well as worry about the comfort and the security of the tenants in the building, you're also responsible for reducing the carbon emissions while keeping your overheads down. Every year, you feel more and more annoyed to see your energy bill go up. You'll be paying 45,000 pounds more on a 100,000 pounds bill by 2020. 
This is happening because only 41% of your energy bill is made up of actual energy costs. The rest of it is made up of various charges based on when you use the energy and government levies to keep the network in balance. This includes running diesel generator plants during peak times. With more renewables and electric vehicles being connected to the system without smarter energy management, these charges are predicted to go up. And don't expect your energy supplier to help. Why would they? Because their current model is based on selling you more kilowatt hours of energy. This is why we created Q Energy. Instead of buying your energy in advance, with Q Energy, we offer energy as a service, which means you pay for what you use. We deliver a cheaper energy bill, reduce your carbon emissions, while improving the efficiency of your building. We do this in four simple steps. You can go onto our website, upload your energy bill, and get a code sent to your email. Then you can click on a link and subscribe to our service. Next, we connect your building to our system so that the data starts flowing. And last, now you can start to see the savings on your bill. Let's explore our technology. We start from the building. So we deploy a smart box in the building. This enables us to connect with the smart meters, building management systems, and other assets like battery storage. By collecting the data, we are able to build an artificial intelligence-based energy model of the building. With this, we are able to make decisions and then send control signals back to the building to optimize the assets. This is not just for one building. It's about managing a network of buildings. So with our Q-Energy Q platform, we connect with the energy markets and the grid to get the data. So once we receive the notifications, we are able to minimize the energy use when the costs are high, maximize when the costs are low. When the grid reaches its peak, we are able to turn down the energy demand automatically, thereby generating revenues from the market. In the UK alone, we are looking at a market size of 375 million pounds per year, and this is set to increase. We are looking at tapping into an un uh, untapped SME market, small and medium-sized business customers, 124,000 of them in the UK, looking to reach 2,000 customers in the next four years. Our business model is quite simple. We charge a fixed fee to the customer while we deal with the charges to the supplier. We optimize the energy, thereby delivering savings for the site and provide services back to the markets, generating revenues. We make our income by taking a percentage of this. We are glad to announce that our system is now live. We are working with one of the largest property companies in the north of England. We've also been selected as part of an Innovate UK project to develop a local energy market here in the London South Bank and also the Mayor of London's Flex London program. Here's a snapshot of our dashboard. Customers are able to manage their buildings. They can see their savings while we send them rewards and notifications. We are one of the first to bring out energy as a service as an offering through a scalable platform. Demand-side response and energy efficiency technologies are currently viable only for high energy users. But by bringing this together with the energy supply contract, we are able to cater to a huge opportunity in the market. Dr. Li Yao and myself, we have worked together before building a successful IoT solutions analytics company in Manchester. We are also supported by a talented team of designers, data scientists, and developers. We are looking to demonstrate the scalability of our system by connecting with 200 sites in the next 18 months. For this, we need to streamline our deployment, ramp up our sales and marketing efforts, and continue with the product development. We need 500,000 pounds of seed investment to make this happen. Every one of us here have a part to play if we are going to reach the carbon reduction targets as a country. 
Join us on this journey as we build a smart, flexible energy system for the future. Thank you. It is still the morning, just. So, good morning. As a mentor, I meet occasionally some startups with a solution in search of a problem. The startup I have the great pleasure of introducing this morning is certainly not one of them. I'm sure most of you heard the scientists' prediction that by year 2050, we'll have more plastic in our oceans than fish. And now, Tom, who heads up the fantastic Vesta team, will tell us why packaging industry worldwide need to embrace bold change and how Vesta will help address this huge global challenge. Tom? You have plastic in your body right now. We all do because we're addicted habitually and economically to cheap, disposable, single-use plastic. We know this is devastating for the natural world, but as we pollute our environment, pollute the things we eat, we pollute ourselves. To change this, we need to be ready to change some of the most fundamental things about the way we manage our lives. That will be really hard. We need more than shock tactics or good intentions if we're going to fix this problem. My name's Tom, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vesta Smart Packaging. At Vesta, we've created a revolutionary range of packages to target the plastic problem. Our mission is to create an enduring and compelling reason for homes and business to use less plastic. A reason that doesn't cost more, a reason that saves time and money, as well as helping the environment. When I want something for my house, like detergent, I go to the shops, I buy online, it comes into my house in a bag or a bottle. It lives in that cupboard under the sink until it runs out and then I throw it in the bin or the recycling and then I hope that recycling happens. Vesta packages change this model. We allow manufacturers to provide their product in a connected container that lives permanently in the home. A container that knows how full it is, that knows when it's running out and critically can order an environmentally friendly refill before it does. The reordering is governed by our central platform that learns behavior so the end users have enough. Not oversupplied, not running out, enough. End users can manage any number of our devices simply through our application. The potential for this solution is vast. $269 billion was spent last year on plastic packaging, but to put it in a bit more context, if every home in the UK used Vesta for just detergent, bleach, and dishwasher templates, our revenues would exceed 250 million pounds, and we'd save 500 million plastic packages each year. We change the way that manufacturers get their products in the hands of end users. Our packages are available off the shelf, or they can be designed and built to any spec we like. A simple monthly fee provides end user management, connectivity, analytics, and reordering, creating a new relationship between the end user and the manufacturer. When I want water, I, I don't go to a well. <laughs> when I want to watch a film, I don't go to Blockbuster. In the future, with Vesta, when I want cereal for my breakfast in the morning, or detergent to wash my clothes. I will not spend my time making sure I have the things I need. Vesta is the next generation of technology-enabled consumer convenience. We make any product available on tap, growing margins, growing loyalty, and providing the, the data set that will enable the next generation of consumer analytics. I'm very fortunate to work with a team of highly skilled individuals, each of whom have more than 10 years 
ex experience in their field. Everything we've done at Vesta, building the devices, designing the devices, the platform, the application, is all done in-house. No need to outsource. As of today, I'm very happy to say that we're working with our friends at Spoon Cereals, Monsoon Coffee, for our first commercial trials in Q1 this year. In the next few weeks, we look forward to announcing a major partnership with one of the world's leading FMCG companies as we partner with them to cut plastic use in millions of homes. Thank you very much. <laughs> when you think about all of the essential products you have in your house, detergent, bleach, dishwasher tablets, shampoo, conditioner, dry goods, cereals, not to mention a wealth of industrial applications, Vesta's global market potential is staggering. We're ready to grow our range of products, continue the development of the app and the platform, and to support our commercial trials. To do that, we're raising 600,000 pounds. The word sustainability, sustainable, has lost a little of its impact in the last couple of years as we've started to use it as just another word for environmentally friendly. It means something different than that. It means something very specific and very important. At Vesta, we've created a model that allows the provision of the most essential day-to-day -day products in just that way, sustainably, creating the incentive to drive the change we all desperately need. We'd love to show you how it works. Come see us for a demo. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dan Ballin. I'm CEO of Ideas Crucible. We're a company that helps entrepreneurs secure investment. So, as we know, in the world of sports, having that competitive edge over their rival is just what managers and coaches are looking for. Whether that be improving the performance of their athletes or trying to find a way to avoid injury for the team. That is why I am delighted to have been asked to introduce a company called Orb Innovation. They have found an intelligent, non-intrusive solution to both these problems. What they have is unique. It's medically endorsed and works in some of the biggest sports in the world. Therefore, I am pleased to introduce their CEO, Rob Patterson. Hi, my name is Rob, co-founder of Orb Innovations. Quite simply, we make contact sport safer to play and help teams to win more. But let's talk rugby, where in a world of marginal gains, coaches try many techniques to help their team to win. One such method is player performance tracking, where players wear sports bra type garments like these, containing GPS trackers and heart rate monitors. Though uncomfortable to wear, requiring manual data processing and being extremely expensive, they're not great and are only accessible to the elite. But Imagine a world where teams of all levels could track their players live and without the need to wear anything extra. Well, imagine no more. Introducing the Orb Smart Guard, tracking fitness, fatigue, and effort by not only knowing how far and fast someone's gone, but by collecting biometrics too. And we do this with something that rugby players already wear, a mouth guard. The unique placing of the device allows us to collect data currently unavailable. Displaying this through our dashboard, we enable coaches to make decisions in real time with a holistic view of both the player's health and their performance. But this is then where it gets exciting and where we're different to everyone else. The data gathered from this very same mouth guard will be used in state-of-the-art research shining new light into where, when, and why concussion occurs in sport. 
Last year, the English Rugby Football Union reported that on average, a concussion occurred in seven out of 10 games. Though, as it's estimated, only one in four concussions are ever reported, it's a much bigger issue than people first think. I mean, I know myself. A few years ago, I was knocked unconscious playing a game of rugby, and it took the doctors two days to realize I had suffered a bleed between my brain and my skull, which left me bedbound for five weeks. This is why I created OP, with our mission to identify head injuries at point of occurrence on the playing field. And we'll do this by working in conjunction with leading research institutions. We are the only company that combines both player performance tracking with concussion analytics. With our focus initially on rugby, we'll be selling directly to teams with a tiered B2B business model, where they'll pay on a subscription basis per player per month, with a basic package for those teams that can't currently afford a solution, and a more advanced package for those top-tiered teams, enabling everyone to play smart whilst further enhancing the capabilities of the elite. In the UK and Ireland alone, the smart guard market is worth 40 million pounds. Globally, that's 230 million. And this is just rugby. If we include other contact sports like American football, ice hockey, and boxing, it's a global market worth 1.7 billion pounds. Today, we've been endorsed by the English Rugby Football Union with an invitation to test our product with them. We began talks with two premiership rugby teams, and to test our product in other sports, we've got an agreement in place with two boxing clubs. We also have an agreement in place with a mouth guard manufacturer, leaving us to focus on the tech inside. The founding team is comprised of myself, Rob, CEO, and Tom, our CTO. Both with a real passion for sport and a background in product design engineering and electronics development, we have the skill set to do this. Combined with our panel of expert advisors with backgrounds in engineering, business, and medicine, as well as our alumni ties with Loughborough University, the best sports university in the world, justifies that we are the team to do this. In July this year, we'll be manufacturing our first batch run of SmartGuard launching to our pilot customers in the autumn. Which is why today we are opening a round of £350,000 to help us achieve our vision of making contact sports safer and helping teams to win. So, who wants to play? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, in the world of IoT, you have people connecting very smart objects, and these two cre together create value and wonderful businesses, and this is wonderful. We had many uh, examples of that. But there is another angle that can be very smart as well, is to pick a very dumb object. Like, the less intelligent you can find out there, the most dirty, the most heavy. And this is what Paul and his team at, at PIN IoT have done. They have spotted a gold mine, an open air gold mine, of hundreds of thousands of objects like this, even millions, right in our streets. In all the streets of London and throughout the country, you have these objects. They are dirty, they are heavy, they are not pretty, they are steel made, they are waste containers. So when you see that this industry is about blind, almost blind about where their assets are, there is a lot of value in working in that space. So it might not be the most pretty story, it might be, not be the most glamorous, the most fashionable today, but it's clearly one of the most robust ones. And the team is very solid as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce Paul. Uh, and he will let you know a bit more about what his ambitions are. Paul from Paul Pinayoti. This is a story about the humble waste container. The bin, the skip, the dumpster. 
Not sexy, but vital to global industry. Let's take our customer, Trevor. He's the asset manager for one of the UK's largest waste management companies. And his job is to manage a fleet of half a million waste containers. His problem is that fundamentally he doesn't really know where they are. They get lost, they get stolen, they get damaged in large quantities. And every year, his business spends up to 20 million pounds buying new ones, with no idea as to where the last ones went. And what's even worse, that despite all of this cost, these containers are often not in the right place at the right time to serve customers. And that means missed revenue and unhappy customers. Not a good combination. Trevor is frustrated, as is the rest of the industry. And this has always been a problem. The good news is that all of this is about to change. Wireless technology has evolved, and it's now possible to track waste containers in real time at very low cost. We have been waiting for this technology to be ready, and that is why we've incorporated PIN IoT. Our solution delivers real-time visibility of waste container fleets by tracking devices that attach to containers, software that processes and presents the data, and support that brings it all together. It works via dual tracking technologies. And what this means is that we can distinguish between normal operational movements and when things get lost or stolen. The software presents the insight to the customer, who is then able to make simple and clear decisions via insights like this, that we are delivering to the industry for the very first time. Real-time visibility of inventory across the estate, showing every single movement. Which containers are available for, for use? How hard the fleet is working commercially? And immediately alerting when containers move in a way that they shouldn't be. These seemingly simple metrics deliver transformation. Revenue increases, customers are happier, containers get damaged less often and cost less to fix. And of course they don't get lost and they can be recovered when they get stolen. So Trevor's 20 million pounds pretty much goes away. We have the team in place to get the job done. Between myself and my co-founders, Chris, Andy, and Sam, we've done this before. We've previously developed and commercialized a comparable product using older technology. We built very similar software, and so we know exactly what to do. And we've decades of know-how in terms of how to drive change in industry environments like waste management that don't change very easily and can be resistant to new technology. So we can go quickly. And we are first to market. What we are doing could not have been done before now. We have traction. We're working with Biffa, the UK's second largest waste management company. And I am delighted to announce that only this week, Biffa have made the decision to commence the rollout of our product into their depot network. <laughs> this is a massive deal for us. We are beyond proof of concept. And the industry has been hugely receptive to what it is that we're doing. Our digital campaigns have generated a response that is six times the market average. And this means we've been able to build a really exciting sales pipeline of other national companies and SMEs, all of whom share the same unresolved problem. This underpins our confidence that we've achieved product market fit, and this is a market that we forecast will grow to be worth 19 billion pounds globally in the years to come. We are moving fast. 
The company has only been incorporated for nine months. We are first to market. We have a working product. The number two player in that market has already committed to us, and we're speaking to three of the other five national operators. We're in a unique position, and we know exactly what to do to take the business forward from here. To deliver this, we'll be raising a seed round of £1.2 million. We will use these funds to build out the product, to get the model right, to get the team in place, to execute growth in the UK market, and to work out what comes next. We are out to transform the waste industry supply chain globally. We'd love to talk to you about what we're doing in more detail. Please come and see us after the presentations. Thank you. All right, all right, all right, as they say. Um, I first of all, I want to thank you because those rounds of applause were so much better. So well done on that. Hang in there because there's a few more that I need from you from the next few slides because there comes a moment where it's my part to ask you know, and give a lot of thank you to people that have been helping us getting there. Um, so again, I have seen a lot of tweets going on, so please keep on doing that. It's really helping the teams to get uh, their visibility out to get you know, to the right important people. So feel free to share that, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever you want to do, but please share. I want to thank our teams again for the amount of energy they put into this, the large effort that they created, sorry, they've, they've put into getting there today. And trust me, as I said, it's been quite a journey. It's only three and a half months, but boy, the work they've done is incredible. So first round of applause for the team, please. The second one, our partners. Again, you've seen some. Thank you. Thank you. Third one, tech.eu. Our friends from tech.eu are here to support and, and literally cover the whole event. So thank you for you guys being here. <laughs> Mentors. As most of us at Solar Bootcamp say, this is the secret sauce of our programs. Without those guys, the team don't grow as well. So I want to personally thank all the mentors that have been very active over the last three years, most of them are been in one or two of the demo days. And so, again, keep coming. We really appreciate your work. It's instrumental in making things happen. And, uh, and you know, I couldn't be more thankful today. So thank you again very much. Now, we have a lot of people to help during the program in addition to the mentors. And I want to thank the in-residence people. Lisa's over there hiding in the corner. Yeah, thank you. Bim was watching us from afar. She's in Sweden right now, has been instrumental in doing those amazing slides. Trust me, this is not our work. She's a professional. Slides are great. So Bim, thank you very much. You, you've seen France already on stage introducing one of the companies before, but he's been also supporting the teams with their financials. Don't have to tell you how important that is. So we're very, very happy to have him. Thank you very much, Francois. And last but not least, Chris, who's in the room somewhere. Where are you, Chris? Where are you hiding? There you go. Here he is. He was our investor in residence. Again, you know, talking to investors, you need to know what to do. Chris, thanks for your help on that. We also have experts that came in. Jeannie, come up. Come on. You didn't expect that, did you? Ha <laughs> ha. Putting you on the stage. Yeah, Jeannie is the person who's make sure that those, you know, properly sort of executed speech were done properly. So thank you so much for your help there. Jeannie, well done. It's been amazing. Paul and Ryan, somewhere in the room, helped us with uh, the positioning, the market traction, the market uh, we call the, the, uh, the market fit, sorry. The market fit. So again, from Growth Studio, fantastic team. Thank you, Paul and Ryan, for your support. I told you there'd be a lot of round of applause. I told you. Right, now, this is the moment for me that is important as well. Because it's a team effort, as you can imagine. I cannot do that on my own. And so I want a very big round of applause for Chan Su, Boyan, and Evo, our team this year. Wherever they are. Yeah, there you go. Are you Boyan somewhere in the back? Yeah. 
But also, it's a bit of a big moment for me because, um, you know, my, uh, my dear uh, Chensu is going to leave us for better pastures. And so I want to have a special thank you for this lady. Chensu, where are you? There you go. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Guys, without her, this does not happen. Okay? As simple as that. So she's going to be joining the dark side of the force, becoming an, an investor herself. So I am very, very proud and very happy to have been work with you. Uh, and, you know, well, no, you're not going anywhere. We'll see each other soon. But, again, thank you so much for what you've done. Look at that photo. That was the very first time we had our logo up the wall. That was exciting. Exciting moments. All right. Now this is the conclusion, the official end of that part of the show. Uh, but, of course, this is not it. We want you guys to come and join us downstairs. There's a lot happening after that. And I want to leave you with a, with a side note, which is an important one for me. As you might know, you know, Startup Bootcamp go over a cycle of, of, of programs, and we go over three years with our partners. So a lot of people wonder, you know, what's after that? What's coming next? And so, you know, the road is quite uh, exciting with so many things I'm actually looking at right now. And you know, without one specifically after the other, but, you know, we want to look at corporate innovation. We want to look at, you know, scale -up programs targeting the latest stage companies. We're talking about digital skills. We're talking about funding. All of those, or combination of those. So bottom line, what I want to say is that there's so much down the road. So, you know, keep watching this space. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Now, on that note, I'll invite you all to come down to where we had our breakfast. And there's going to be a lot more snacks and people. And please talk to the teams. Thank you very much.